Hello and welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe Podcast. And the Animation Deliberation Podcast. Today I'm here with both Jay Scotty and Zuhair Ali as we discuss episode 14 of The Bad Batch. All that more after a commercial break we have no control over. Welcome back. I'm Matthew, your host. One quick piece of business before we jump in. As you know, this podcast is a proud part of the Stranded Panda Podcast Network. Uh, Grand Pandissimo himself, Matthew Carroll, the, uh, one of the founders of the Stranded Panda Podcast Network, uh, his music group, the, uh, the Garage, has just put out a great album called Save Each Other. It's all kind of music inspired by Star Trek, uh, and especially the Star Trek Picard show. He's been covering that on the uh, Star Trek podcast that's on Stranded Panda. It's a great album. Check it out. You can buy it by uh, Googling The Garage Save Each Other, or just look for it on Spotify, uh, The Garage Save Each Other. So I want to give that a quick plug. Now back to Star Wars. I'm really excited. Once again, we have both Jay Scotty and Zuhair here to discuss this episode. Uh, so for you both, let's just jump right in. What would you think? Well, I'm feeling uh, about as giddy with anticipation as I believe Crosshair was feeling at the end of this episode. It was <laughs> all across the board, fired on all cylinders for me. The story, the characters, the animation, the action, the music as always. One of my favorite episodes of the show thus far. Mm -hmm. I agree with those sentiments. This is definitely one of the best episodes. Like, this is kind of in confliction to last week of what I said, but this actually could have been episodic, and I still would have loved the episode the same. Like, they could have gotten away safely, and I would have loved it. Um, but it mm -hmm. was so well done. It was so cool seeing Gregor and a little of his origin story. Uh, it was neat seeing this transition over to the official Stormtroopers, but yeah, I, I love a a stealth mission gone wrong and just the action and intensity yep. and everything. It was it was perfect it was just so well done well and i'm glad to hear that because zuhair i know in our last episode you specifically said that i think we all said but especially zuhair you were bringing this up that you were a little concerned going into these last three episodes because it felt like there was so much we needed to cover and that we kind of we were wanting to get into kind of like the final arc mm -hmm. are, are you now feeling like a lot more confident that we're getting what you were hoping for yeah now knowing that we have this episode and then two more coming up i feel like it is going to be well-rounded they're going to have their they're going to have their issues. They're going to have their conflict to go through. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of intensity and a lot mm -hmm. of oh snap moments. And I'm all for it. I'm loving it. I'm really excited to see what these next two episodes are. My hope has been revived. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I think I definitely feel the same way. I, By the end of this episode, I had a clear sense of where we're going. It, it felt like we're tying the story into some of the larger stories about the clones, which was great. We're getting some resolution about the like the the clones becoming the stormtroopers story, which is great, and about the the Kami, uh, Owens, which is great, and then having the like you know clearly I think this sets up what the last two episodes are going to be with Hunter being captured by Crosshair because it feels to me like I, I don't know exactly the details and I'm glad for that, but like I, I imagine the last two episodes are mostly going to be about the Crosshair and Hunter interacting, the the gang trying to get Hunter back. And probably somewhere along the way, either Crosshair having some kind of change of heart or them just capturing Crosshair or something like that. But there's going to be a lot of the, the sort of story we've been, we've been wanting to build up to this whole time of really kind of like the Crosshair versus the Bad Batch and the, all the divided loyalties, I think is finally going to come to, head, to a head. And I think they've set it up really well. I mean, I know you haven't seen Agre Coruscant yet, but are you happy with um, just the Empire's involvement and in seeing this transition and kind of how the behind the scenes are working? <laughs> I think given... <laughs> yeah, I know, it's kind of a, a sigh. Um, I think given hmm. what already happened, I think this will be good enough. Like, I think it's still... I, I still wish we'd had a lot more time on Coruscant. I wish we had had, you know, I, I wish we'd had more Tarkin. I wish we had more of Crosshair sort of dealing with all this. But I think given how little we had gotten, I think this is like, okay, at least they put a head nod to it. Hmm. And they've sort of filled in enough of the details that either headcanon or later stories can fill in some more of it. Gotcha. So we brought up Gregor. And let's kind of just start right there. Jay Scotty, for you, this is a completely new character, right? Oh, totally, yeah. Had no familiarity with Gregor whatsoever. 
Cool. So what, what was your take on him? I liked Gregor, and I liked the purpose that he served for the story, uh, but full transparency in comparison to like another clone that we got introduced to recently, Hauser, and, you know, um, take it with a grain of salt here because we've already spent two episodes with Hauser, whereas this is just my first episode with Gregor. Uh, he didn't really stand out as much to me, and I know uh, Bradley D. Baker has to do a lot of voices, um, and, and credit mm-hmm. to him for making so many different voices sound so unique. I, I just thought it was an interesting vocal performance. Like He sounded like his voice had a tendency to crack a little bit more than the other clones, so yeah. I didn't know... I didn't, I didn't, I, Compared to some of the other vocal performances, it didn't just didn't resonate with me as well. But like I said, I, I enjoyed the character for the purpose he served. He definitely um, gave us a lot of exposition in a short amount of time, just letting us know that hey, the the clones are being replaced. Like it's already happening. Um, we thought it was right. happening, but it, it, yeah, it's happening. Hmm. Yeah, and I think as so we're here in a minute, I'll ask you to kind of fill us in on the Gregor story because I, I remember it. And I think it's important. I want to make sure our audience and Jay Scotty, you get to hear it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the first thing I'd say to the voice, my take on it was that the kind of weird little vocal things he was putting in was to show Gregor as being very mentally unstable, which kind oh, of okay. plays into the, the story we know of him. That wasn't as much like his, his accent as him being kind of a little kooky. Okay. Uh, Zuhair, is that what you got as well? Yeah. When it started off, I had no idea which uh, clone this was supposed to be. And when he was smack talking mm-hmm. in the cell and he had that, <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, it's that one. I know which one this one is. This is the kooky one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but okay. like yeah. in Rebels, we've only seen him as the kooky old man. So seeing him as a kooky person in his prime was just, it was fantastic to see. Right. <laughs> and just those, well, uh, I, the, just the way that his voice was. And I was cracking up every time that he spoke. I was like, I love this guy so much. <laughs> Interesting. Well, and do you remember where he comes from in the Clone Wars? Because he actually does play an important part in the Clone Wars show as well, although from a not very well known episode because it's not very good. I'm honestly drawing a blank on the on the Clone Wars inclusion, but I do remember him in Rebels. Sure. Yeah, and it's funny because I I hadn't made the connection between the person in Rebels and this person from the Clone Wars until I, I did a bit of digging about this character now. Huh. So in the Clone Wars, there's a set of episodes where. Basically, a group of droids goes on an adventure led by this little colonel who's from an alien race. It's very short. It's 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 cute. It's by no means the best set of episodes. Hmm. But the the Gregor character is one of the best because uh, we find out he is a former clo- he is a clone who uh, got knocked unconscious during a battle, woke up with amnesia, and wound up being kind of like integrated into the society. Uh, with only one person real, with a person who kind of found him, knowing he was a clone and not telling him, so it, it wound up in the Clone Wars being a really interesting story of another example of someone who was kind of exploring what could life be like outside the clones. Mm. In that episode, he winds up deciding to, you know, be, go back to being a clone, and, and like he's got a lot of guilt that he, you know, survivor's guilt and things like that, and he winds up deciding to sacrifice himself towards the end of the the episode to save everybody else. Oh, okay. And it's a powerful scene. It's one that actually, um, if you go back to the episode about it um, in our Clone Wars uh, episodes on the same podcast, we, we talked about it with myself and uh, Riki and Sarah Hayashi. Mm-hmm. And we were pretty critical. We didn't really love the way his story ended because it had a lot of like, well, why can't a soldier just have his own life? Why does he have to go back to like all this sacrifice and stuff? But, but either mm-hmm. way, it was, it was a very powerful moment that he sacrificed himself. And... Like I said, Zuhair, I didn't. I never connected because I think I watched Rebels when it had been like five years after I watched Clone Wars, and then I went back and watched Clone Wars, mm. and so I didn't make the connection between that character. So I had I had not realized we already knew the character was still alive. So maybe my complaint is more with Clone with Rebels than with this. But I kind of didn't love seeing him for that reason. I, I mean, this is my gripe about a lot of things. Like if you if you show us a character who dies, they should be dead and let them be dead. Um, this thought might come up later if the three of us wind up discussing Masters of the Universe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but so to me, I, like, but putting that aside, I did think it was a great callback to this very interesting character, and I thought he was, to me, my favorite part of it was really getting to highlight how Echo is still 
much more of a reg mm-hmm. than everybody else in his thinking. Totally. And the way that he was able to say, like, look, if you were willing to go back and save me, then you also have to be willing to go back and save him. That was such a powerful uh, dialogue. I, to me, that was just such a powerful moment. Agreed. Yeah, that one that one hit me a little bit because it was like that was an intense set of episodes too, and it was really emotional when Rex got to uh, reunite with Echo after like all the mm-hmm. stuff. Like, right. I know he's alive. I know he's alive. I know he's alive. So it's like Echo has that in him of just kind of like we can't do this. Like we know everyone's worth saving, and that yeah, that hit hard. Right. Well, especially because we've been having this kind of running conversation with. Uh, Omega clearly thinking of them as like, you know, in her kind of naive but wonderful way is very heroic and and them being, some of them at least being a little more sort of self-serving. And and to me, at least on our superhero ethics podcast, we talk about this a lot. I always think that kind of one of the lines of being a hero is, are you willing to use your powers to save the person you don't know? You know, like if you've got powers and you use them to protect your family and to, you know, save your friends, like that's awesome. Good for you. But to me, that doesn't make you a hero necessarily. It's when you start using them for the person you don't know that it really kind of crosses a line. And so I, I just loved that whole dynamic and, and the way Echo was able to convince them, like, yeah, we got this is one of our brothers. We've got to do this. I, I, I just got to say, I, I hate to divert too much, but all the stuff you're talking about right now, I'm watching My Hero Academia, and one of the major Academia. through lines of that is what it means to be a hero. So just like hearing you talk about oh, that, that's just, awesome. yeah, really, really right, strikes yeah, I, a chord I, right I, now. I, I keep hearing I need to watch that show for superhero ethics, and so I probably will, and we'll get you on it at some point. Oh, get Zuhair on it as well, because he was the one that has been staunchly recommending it to me for some time. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So what what else did you like about this episode, or what else do you have thoughts on, good or bad? Well, I'll just go ahead and talk about how beautiful the episode was. Camino, Mm -hmm. seeing that Star, uh, Star, Star Destroyer next to the the cloning facility with the rain and the lightning in the background. Uh, James Hewing, Yoda Hu, um, to the stranded pa- stranded panda community, reached out to me and like took a, a shot of like that shot in particular and said he wants that mounted on a canvas. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and then just the planet Darrow that we got to spend time on. Again, we've talked so much about the lighting, but I really appreciated the way the light kind of cascaded through the foliage and the canopy. And you got to see all the different levels of light and the shadows being casted on these characters. And it's just, we have it almost feels like it's been since Return of the Jedi on Endor that we've really got to spend a an outright amount of time in just like a, a place that reminds me of my own backyard. Not to brag too much here, but I, I live in Central California, so like the Redwoods are not that far away. And it really just, it, it felt very realistically and and artistically brought to life and i love seeing that part of the star wars universe uh, so well done Mm -hmm. i'm glad that you said that because as i was watching those scenes when they landed i was like i really want to go for a hike right now like specifically (laughs) in california (laughs) yeah exactly yeah yeah it was incredibly beautiful and i I really love the way it, it kind of set the tone for so much of this uh, and I, I would just love hearing you all comment on it because I've said like I'm not I'm not the visual person who won't catch those details, but it, it I love that they're using that to tell the story in such powerful ways. That that really means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah. I have to say I think my favorite moment though was um, Hunter being left behind because mm-hmm. I thought it was such a nice. First of all, it was such a nice contrast and a like to me it's easy to kind of say like. Well, no, no, you always do the heroic thing. You always take the risk. You always go back to save the friend. And that's clearly where Omega is lying. But I think kind of what this highlighted is that there, there, there have to be lines. You know, there have to be some times where you do say, like, wait a minute, it's not worth it. Like, we, we can try to get them later, but, like, the odds here are too much. And it was heartbreaking watching Omega, you know, try to convince Wrecker to go back but I felt like it was still such an important moment where we've been, like, so many times recently Omega had convinced them. And, and especially being a hunter himself, you know, it wasn't them saying, like, oh, well, they want him to rest. They want they want to be rescued, but we can't. It was Hunter himself saying, like, I need to protect you all. Um, you, you have to go save yourselves. Because this may kind of stretch, but, like, this whole episode was making me have a very, like, musketeers feel because hmm. of the kind of, like, all for one, one for all. Like, so much of the discussion of, like, we have to go back to save this one reg 
it was very much like all for one. You know, we have to go do this. Right. And then the other side of it being Hunter being like, no, I don't want you all to throw away your lives on this hopeless attempt to save me. Like I, w- I now will be willing to sacrifice myself to protect you with the hope that you're going to come rescue me at some point, clearly. But I think, I think the Hunter's mind, like he may well think this is it for him. And he's really okay saying you all like one for all, you know, I will take the sacrifice that you all can save yourselves. I think some of the yeah. dialogue helps with a little bit of the, the hope factor too, because Gregor even said he was like, I got out of here once before I got captured, but I got out. So I think that kind of like instilled yeah. in his brain a little bit. It's like, okay, even though tech was saying the chances were minimal, like there still is a chance, but I think there was right. a little bit of a, I told you so moment also because of that back and forth mm-hmm. at the beginning of should we go, should we not go, should we go? Should... And everybody was casing their points that Wrecker was happily nodding his head to. Yeah, I, I love that part. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you also see him getting really fed up at one point because as a leader, it's like he knows everyone is his responsibility. He says, I know this is a bad idea. And then at one point he even says, like, before it was up for a debate, this is an order. And I think right. everyone has gotten a little more free with being vocal, and Hunter's getting the negative consequences of that more than anybody else, especially as the leader, yeah. it's his responsibility, and the amount of times that somebody's gotten hurt, or they've lost, or uh, things got overcomplicated, I feel like he's getting tired of saying, I told you so. So this was his big, like, I'm left behind now. This is for you guys to figure out and understand that listening to me kind of helps sometimes. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, because now they, I hadn't even thought about it. They have to figure out how to rescue him without him. And I'm sure Rex is going to come in and come up with the solutions, but overall it's like, good luck, guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of like, I'm sure Rex will help, but I kind of do hope that it's not him. I hope that they do, like, I mean, it'll probably be Omega then. Yeah. But, like, I kind of hope that they do have some level of, like, how... A, recognizing all that, that Hunter does for sure. And, and I think it'll, it'll be some level of Omega needing to recognize, like, yeah, like, the, the idealism has to be balanced somewhat with reality. But, but yeah, I, I, I mean, clearly, I think we end the episode with Hunter back with the Bad Batch. We, we end the season with Hunter back with Bad Batch. I don't think that's in much doubt. Yeah, unless they decide to go for a huge cliffhanger, I, I would agree with you. I, I would have to imagine that he does in the season back with the family there. But just talking about them having to figure out how to rescue Hunter without Hunter, I did think another thing that this episode did really strongly, and all the episodes have done, but I thought it was done a little more pronounced in this episode, is really getting to showcase all the individual members, their particular skill set and why it contributes. Like, we're talking about Hunter. He It's been a while since we've got to see him use his tracking skills to mm-hmm. um, such great detail when he lined out exactly the path that um, Gregor took when he was being tr- tracked down initially. And then Tech really stood out to me as well. He doesn't always get a lot of action, but when he kind of hopped out into that hallway and got to do the double stun guns, and then uh, mm-hmm. when he took over the, the flight controls for Omega, and, and you know, talking about Omega being the one to potentially step into Hunter's role. We saw her again mimicking the knife knife flip. I'm sure a lot of people out there will appreciate those knife flips there. But then again, she was piloting the ship and doing a great job until Tech was the one that had to take over. It was just and while I'm talking about the sh- the sh- the ships and the and the action, some of the best dog fighting I've seen in all of Star Wars. This was yes. great yeah. great action. Yeah, the Razor Crest was an awesome ship, but I think the Marauder has taken number one for me. <laughs> yeah, I. It does remind me that the Empire Pilot Training Program clearly has absolutely no section on collision, collu- <laughs> uh, on collision avoidance, yeah. <laughs> which would be very useful for them to have. Uh, that there was one moment, like, because there's some moments where that happens, like the Falcons going through like these very narrow passages, where I'm like. You know what? We've seen this gag a bunch. We don't need to see it again. But when it was literally like there was no difficult passage, it was just them <laughs> flying at a mountain and then turning, and and at least one of the Empire ships crashed into the mountain. I was like, find a new trick, guys. Come on. <laughs> like, but other than that moment, yeah, I thought it was all fantastic. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, present company was not excluded for the knife trick stuff. I was looking at that very adamantly. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was really well done. I that figured really well as done. much. <laughs> well, so what are our predictions for? Uh, you know, obviously we're going to get some crosshair hunter interaction. What, what do we, where do we think that goes? How, how, if you had to sketch out, what do you think is happening in the next two episodes? Where do we wind up? Hmm. Well, I've been on the record. I don't want crosshair to be redeemed. So I'm, I guess my one hope for these episodes, I'm, I'm not super big into predictions per se, because I, I am a big advocate of, you know, um, taking what is presented to you and, and appreciating in that regard. Now, the discussion I, I'm all for and the, and the speculation, I, I appreciate that aspect of it, but I do try to go in with, you know, re- relatively, I won't say low expectations, but I try to keep my expectations in check. So I guess I would say my hopes for the upcoming conflict with Hunter and Crosshair is that we really get to lean into that sadistic side of Crosshair and see what really yeah. makes him a compelling <clears throat> villain and maybe outside of the... Um, you know, the chip enhancement, maybe we do get that context that he's just really doing this because he likes it. And, um, I, I so you want him to stay full on villain. I, I, that's my, that's honestly my hope for the end of the series. Mm-hmm. I hope he's not taken out and he is able to be set up to be one of the more compelling villains in the star Wars universe that doesn't necessarily live in the shadow of, of some of these larger than life villains, you know, Sidious and, Vader uh, included in that company. I guess, yeah, that, yeah, I would say that's my hope. Uh, yeah, you kind of you kind of nailed what I was going to say. I, I feel <laughs> like there is going to be a standoff between Hunter and Crosshair. And it's going to be like, you better kill me because I'm not letting you go type of situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I don't know if I'm fully so. I wouldn't mind Crosshair coming back to some extent, but I, I, I know this: if Crosshair is evil, 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 and then they stun him and take the chip out of his head, and then everything is fine, that will feel like a huge letdown to me. Sure. Yeah. Like, I, I definitely need to feel because I, I feel like a lot, and, I, and this is why like, I, I want that kind of big confrontation conversation between him and Hunter because I feel like a lot of this is, you know, problem. There's probably, like, a lot of resentment that Crosshair always had about, like, Hunter being the leader or things like that. Sure. Or, you know, I want more of that to come out. Um, I, again, I, I'm with you. It's not that I love going too deep into predictions, but it's just kind of fun to kind of think about oh, like, of where all this could go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm imagining that we might get a sort of thing where, like, we have a situation where Crosshair is definitely the one in control. And then at some point, like, the dynamics are flipped and now Hunter's the one in control. And that's where, like, you'll have to kill me because I won't stop coming after you or something like that. Um, cause yeah, I, I think it could be, there's all sorts of directions it can go, but I, I, I just definitely want us to get, I think for me, especially because there's one moment that was early in the show and maybe I'm holding on to it way more than I need to, mm-hmm. but there was that moment when Crosshair was first starting to work with the non-clones and they all kind of file into the bunks that they had with the Bad Batch and you see Crosshair kind of like looking to the signs of the, the things the Bad Batch had done in that room and there's a kind of look on his face if he's sort of having like mixed feelings about something. Yeah, I, I want I do there to be that. some kind of payoff of that. Like, even if it is Crosshair still deciding, like, the chip is out, but I'm still staying with the Empire. Like, I, I'd be down for that. But I want to just see a little bit of his kind of mixed feelings. Like, I, I just want to know more about him. You know, I want to get more sure. of his interior thoughts during all this. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, think, but we'll see. There's a, I, there's a, I think, like we all said, I'm now so jazzed up for these last two episodes. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so much happened, and I feel like there's a lot that we haven't talked about. So, just off the top of my head, some of, like, the visual callbacks and cues. As one of the... Um, I, I've been gaming, as far as Star Wars goes, for a long time. And they talk about the c- clone commandos that were there, as well as the TK mm-hmm. Troopers. I'm not familiar with TK Troopers, but I loved seeing those lit up, like um, like turquoise visors that was a total callback to the republic commando game with delta squad and it was so cool to see that's definitely awesome Mm -hmm. what about fuse of hair we're kind of uh probably can start wrapping up any other kind of last comments from either of you about the episode uh or not even comments like just things we want to get into i'm not sure i'm just i'm really happy with the episode um Jay Sky said the dogfight was awesome. The stealth stuff was awesome. 
Uh, Echo pushing that dude into the hallway so he could get shot up and fall off the cliff was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I really don't know what else to say. I'm sure once we stop recording, I'll be like, why didn't I talk about this more and more? But I, I, I think we kind of got the gist of it. I'm going to watch oh. this episode far more times. It was just, man, it was just, it was really good. That's all I can say. It was what, really about, mm-hmm. what about the, uh, the Kaminoan Prime Minister? Oh, yeah. Karma got him good. Oh, yeah, we even talked about that story. Karma got him good. He was trying to get all of his resources out of there. It's like, oh, I need a scientist. Don't need a politician. I was like, ooh. Yep. Yeah, like, I kind of liked how they'd been working together somewhat, but he was so quick to sort of throw the scientist under the bus. Like, and were you surprised that we didn't hear a gunshot, like a, a laser, a blaster shot after those doors had closed on the prime minister with the soldiers? Because that clearly seemed to me the indication of what was about to happen. Oh, totally. Uh, I I guess yes and no. I was kind of expecting to get the blaster shot just to get that finality and that closure. Mm-hmm. But it, then again, it is a, a kid's show. So, I mean, it, it was a pretty dark moment as it was already. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. It, it did leave me sort of thinking, like, I don't... He's the prime minister. So, in theory, he's like the governmental leader of this planet. But the way they were discussing it, it sounded like this was just like the CEO and the, and the chief tech officer of a small company, you know? Um, <laughs> and that's a whole other thing. We never really got much about Kaminoa itself. But that, that there's a little bit of that that struck me as a little off. But, you know, in the end, that's a, a pretty small deal. Sure, sure. I mean, the, the show is doing a lot. Um, I think we've talked about the length of this season, some of the quote-unquote filler episodes, whether or not um, it's biting off more than it can chew. But I, I will just say, um, at this point, we we were a little bit negative on the last episode, and I still maintain there was a lot of good to take away from that la- uh, last episode, but it did just kind of feel like weird momentum, a weird momentum shift, like kind of a halt mm-hmm. of proceedings. But um, in retrospect, like it just makes me appreciate um, this episode that much more. Just, you know, it does make me so amped up for these final two episodes so yeah uh, definitely. i think this is definitely one of the best episodes we've had this season yeah uh so i did look it up for tk that's just kind of like the designation uh-huh. for standard troopers um i guess tk 2147 okay. was the maintenance dude on the death star um, ah okay that's rex is ct 7567 um callus goes by lrc01 so it's like it just it's just kind of like a designation for like what your rank and job and identification is okay Mm -hmm. gotcha gotcha luke infiltrates the death star disguises a stormtrooper referred to as tk421 okay okay yeah and i think um tk is also a reference to george lucas's like student movie that he made about robots oh cool i don't remember the exact details Uh, i think that's kind of a cool call i thought that one was thx Oh, you may be right there. You may yeah. be right. All right, well, I think that's about it's all I have to say. Is there any other last things you want to add about the episode before we wrap up? Go watch it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. All right, well, and speaking of other things people should watch and listen to, uh, what's happening with Animation Liberation these days? Yeah, right now we are in the midst of our He-Man coverage. So Masters of the Universe Revelation just dropped July 23rd on Netflix. That's coming from Kevin Smith. So... Uh, I did a primer episode with Brian V. Klein, friend of the show, friend of the network, and he brought in a He-Man expert, Dale Morris, that curated a classic 10 episodes for us to watch. So we kind of covered those to just kind of introduce people to the world of He-Man. And then, of course, we provided our instant reaction for those first five episodes. And then we're actually uh, shortly here. The three of us are going to be having a conversation, just kind of a a follow-up to... Um, mm-hmm you know some of the reactions to masters of the universe so very excited for that and uh just around the corner here what if so uh that's uh wow it's that's actually only like less than two weeks away as i'm as i'm looking at the calendar here so stay tuned Definitely. for that that's t-o-o-n-e-d and then just to hit a couple <laughs> yeah. of things that have come out and that we're redoing is uh we got the ball mm-hmm. rolling on demon slayer uh excited to oh, yeah. do some uh rewatch on that as season two approaches this year and now that Ryan the Last Dragon has been on Disney Plus for a while and more people have gotten the opportunity to enjoy it, we're going to have a guest host to talk about that as well. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Yeah, definitely check out Animation Liberation Podcast if you haven't already. It's definitely worth a subscribe. I'll also say uh, on the animation front, uh, myself and Paul Hoppy just did an episode on the Superhero Ethics Podcast all about two animated movies, Luca and then Raya and the Last Dragon. And Raya, I know you guys are going to do an episode on pretty soon that I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. We did this episode on kind of the concept of kids' movies and animation and the idea that, like, people kind of look down on on quote-unquote kids' movies, but how they can really be, like, very powerful kind of storytelling and enjoyable and family-friendly, but by no means, like, not for adults. Uh, And so that's an episode I really like. And and it's part of the thing, you know, check out this podcast, check out the Superhero Ethics Podcast. You can find all my podcasts under the name The Ethical Panda. If you go to theethicalpanda.com, and that's a great place to send feedback. Uh, we have these conversations because I, I love talking to you all, but also love hearing from the fans. And we've been getting great feedback uh, all along the way. We'd love to keep getting it. We'll probably do a feedback episode at the end of Bad Batch. But if you've got questions, if you've got comments, if you've got things you thought we got wrong or things you want to add to the conversation, please let us know. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter at The Ethical Panda. You can also email theethicalpanda at gmail.com. Or again, just go to theethicalpanda.com. There you'll find all the podcast information. If you're liking these podcasts, a great thing you can do is give us a five-star review. It helps make sure people can find us. Uh, and that goes for Star Wars Universe Podcast, Stranded Panda, Animation Liberation. Just go to iTunes or whatever is your favorite uh, podcast uh, app. Look for their review section and just give us a five-star review. Or if, they, if you think we don't deserve five stars, you know, give us what you think we deserve and give us the feedback. Feedback always helps. But the more especially five-star reviews we get, the more people can hear this, the more people can join in the conversation. And it's just great for everybody. So please check out all that. Check out Matt Carroll's album uh, by The Garage that we mentioned before. And most importantly, have a good day.